You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is Monday. It is Mental Health Monday, and we continue our conversations in emotions and the gospel with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Good morning, Heidi. Good morning. We are moving forward into another chapter in emotions and the gospel. Sarah, are you enjoying reading this book? I am very much enjoying reading this book. Digging deep into this book. It's fantastic. (laughs) I am recommending it to everybody. (laughs) So I just order a case of them. Just order a case. There you go. That's the way to go. So hand them out. (laughs) What prompted this? Why was this chapter called too emotional a part of this book before we even dig into like all the fun questions about being too emotional. Why was it important to you to include that in this book? You know, this is in a section on emotional half-truths, if you will. And I think, honestly, anytime we talk about theology, number one, we have to identify half-truths. It's written all over the epistles of the New Testament. You know, ideas get started, like we talked about in another episode, and we tend to run with them. We want some... I don't even think they're easy answers, but they seem simplified to us. And so they get going. And the myth of too emotional, if you will, especially was near and dear to my heart. I think as a woman in culture, this myth has been around me my whole life. But then also working in church work care, especially with people in caregiving professions, so pastors and commissioned workers and then also my work in in first responders and things, I I noticed that this is applied and let's say over applied to so many people whose gifts are empathy or are bringing emotions and the safety of allowing people to feel their emotions into a room where we tend to elevate logic and reason. And there's a place for that. And we'll get to that in this episode. But at the same time, I think we quote unquote, shoot ourselves in the foot when we don't allow our workers within the church and then the people within the church as well to to use those gifts that include um, empathy and this idea that often culturally is portrayed as too emotional. Yeah, I want to touch on several things that you just said, but but first, before we get there, what what prompts this use of the phrase too emotional? I'm sure we've Well, I shouldn't say all. Many of us have probably experienced this, especially as a woman. What what prompts the use of this phrase? Mm, Discomfort is, Mm. I think, the very clear primary reason. There's probably a million more, but we essentially are meant to read each other's emotions, whether we verbally state them or not between the two of us. And so when you bring your emotions to the table, as it were, I, my body intrinsically picks them up and doesn't mean that I have to hold them. And that's a skill to be learned that I don't have to hold your emotions. At the same time, my awareness is built into me by God, I believe, of what you are emotionally feeling. And so we can communicate better so that we are connected at a deep human level that God himself has knit into us with, we've talked about mirror neurons and other neuroscientific and nervous system processes so that we as humans are knit together instead of isolated islands. And so That's going to be uncomfortable at times, especially in a broken world where we aren't always aware of our own emotions and what we're bringing. And we're not always reading other people's correctly. We are imperfect people and that's okay. Part of the work of relationship is that discomfort. (laughs) You know, it's just like God works redemption in brokenness. It's not like redemption comes in perfection. That's not the way it works. Same way, relationships really are formed in the work of this back and forth and understanding each other that is discomfort and not just like the cozy, fuzzy feelings of relationship. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain intention that people have when they're using, and I know this is like very generalization language (laughs) here, but is, is there, is there a general intention that happens when people use this phrase? Hmm. I would like to bring my baggage to the room and say that, (laughs) 
from my experience, and I'm only speaking from my experience, I'm not speaking from research right now, and that's important. I think that people want to shut down that discomfort and feeling of overflow of emotion, right? So the emotional overwhelm is real. And that's that, you know, it borders on distress or at least makes us feel like we're leading toward distress, which is one of the most ironically stressful things <laughs> that we experience as humans is that our bodies go into fight and flight and flooding and freeze and all of those things. And so I think the intention is really to shut it down so that we are returned to not just comfort, but almost a sense of harmony, peace, right? Like we can elevate peace so much so that we create an idol out of it. And then we're running after it instead of running after whatever God is doing in the moment in that room. So I do think that's the intention. And that's me um, attempting not to project my own hurt from this phrase onto that. I do think I will say in bringing my baggage into the room that there is some intention of hurt here. There is a power and control mechanism with this one in particular that exists within Western culture and in American culture in particular, that there are people that are just uncomfortable with other people holding some power. And one way we capture it is by using any phrase that includes two <laughs> to describe them. You're too much. You're too emotional. You're too loud. You're too, you know, you pick the phrase. <laughs> two. You're too, too. Mm -hmm. Too, too much. Just uh, too much. <laughs> why are, and Maybe I'm making an assumption here, but I think at some point we've all probably used a phrase like maybe not too emotional, but we've all used a two mm -hmm. phrase mm -hmm. at some point. Why are we afraid of too emotional or too loud or too sensitive? Why, why are we afraid of... <laughs> feelings yeah <laughs> i was like oh how do you feel in that plank right i feel like we're all being very cautious which is really good because i do think this is a sensitive topic and you know andy would be interesting in your own experience as a male like i invite you to bring that to the table as sarah and i talk about our female experiences i think one thing you read that was a little different than from what i said that adds to this conversation is that anxiety or fear that comes with emotion in the room there's a book about family systems in, in congregational life that's really helpful and it talks about how in a meeting, if you will, or in congregational life, that whoever holds the most anxiety, everyone else will rise up to that. Like that's how our systems are made to read the highest level of emotion in the room. And so I do think we're afraid of like the emotional vortex pit that will pull us in. And then, you know, we lose all reason. We, we feel like we can't get out of that emotional place. That's important to recognize that there it's called a partial truth because there is some truth to we want to be able to maintain in dialectal behavior therapy what we call wise mind, which is both emotion mind and reason mind, getting information from our emotions, but not letting them be the leaders of everything, nor letting our reason and logic only lead us, but letting God lead us and utilizing these tools to our benefit. And I think that anxiety is worth noting. So how is how is this a misconception? Is it a misconception that that people are too emotional? I think so. I mean, who gets to decide that? I guess would be my oh. question, right? Who gets to decide what is too too much, too emotional, too whatever? I would say God, right? That's actually our belief system that we are not judge. We are not the people who have absolute truth in our back pockets and can like confer it on people. Instead, all we can do is open scripture, be in it, be connected to God in our prayer life, in our relational life, in his word, so that we have discernment. I think we've brought that word up over and over again in this series, that there is a place for discernment and God gives us that. But we are not judges of what is too emotional. And that's why I would caution about throwing that around. I don't, 
I think of certain experiences, especially we have a lot of judgment around grief in our culture. How much is too much grief? How long is too long for grief? Where are you allowed to have grief and bring those tears and struggles and anger and frustration to the to the place that you're in? Who can you share that with? That would be a primary example, I think, of are we really benefiting ourselves by defining what is too much, too emotional? Or are we best served by stepping back and allowing people to be themselves, allowing them to have the gospel for this thing as well, and to experience God's tender care for their emotional life? I really think that's something we're missing when we throw down this misconception or this half-truth. And then there's the reality that it's more often research indicates applied to people in minority groups. Okay, that's a problem. Anytime something is applied drastically different across the field of humanity, we have to ask ourselves, like, whether that's God's truth or whether that's something within our culture. Yeah, how much of this is cultural? Like, how much of this do we do we learn from culture mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to, like, baked into our personalities? I don't know. That's a terrible way of saying it. But, no, but you're right. How much, like, how much of it is culture is the basic question. And it's a, re- a really good one. We're going to address that a lot in the next episode when we talk about unified facial response. But I do think consider even just go to the scriptures and the the Hebrew culture, the the Jewish culture of the Old Testament, and look at how they deal with emotions differently. What is allowed in spaces? Think about the acts of mourning and grief and the way they deal with that differently than we do. Okay, so if we are utilizing scripture to inform us, there's a reason we're not that Hebrew culture, that Jewish culture, But also, can we learn something from them? And I think that's where we want to be with all cultural experiences. Think about any time you've traveled abroad, but in a different region of the U.S. and people's Mm -hmm. responses to different emotion and how much emotion they're allowed to share, which ones are quote unquote positive or quote unquote negative, that informs us. And then we can, um, you know, navigate our own a little bit better when we're just aware of those cultural layers. All right. I have practical questions, but I have to save them for the next segment because I like to think, I don't know, I think more in practicalities Mm -hmm. than what's floating around in my brain. All right. Well, (laughs) sorry. Now words don't make sense, but we'll, we'll make them make sense in just a moment. You're listening to the coffee hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. We are in emotions and the gospel, and we're talking about too emotional. What Mm -hmm. does this phrase mean? How is it used? How is it it even dangerous? I don't know if dangerous is the right word, but unhelpful, hurtful. Yes, thank you. Hurtful. Mm-hmm. Hurtful. Mm-hmm. I think it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't lead to health, right? Like it. It's not whole yeah. enough of a picture. If, like we said, a lot of the problems here are when we talk about oversimplification instead of allowing that complexity. Mm-hmm. So, what do? So let's say I'm the guilty party here. I'm talking with someone and I'm uncomfortable with their level or expression of emotion. And it's not helpful for me to say they're too emotional. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's that's clearly not helpful. But I'm not comfortable having a conversation or uncomfortable with the situation. What's a good way to resolve that, mm-hmm. or even mm-hmm. you know express that without being mm-hmm. like, without right. saying you're too emotional? <laughs> right. No, absolutely. Well, I think one thing you're identifying is that we all have our personal boundaries. 
And we Mm -hmm. all have a window of tolerance is what we call it in EMDR therapy, that we want to be able to continue navigating the situation. And we notice that there's a space where it's going to be difficult for us to navigate it, that we have to state that and and address it. So Daryl Zimmerman from Grace Place Wellness Ministries, which I believe is now part of LCEF, is the one who taught me the phrase disarming honesty. And this isn't a rude kind of honesty. It's just something we simply don't culturally do, which is name the emotions in the room, name what's going on inside of us or what we note is going on between us. And I think that can serve us really well here. It's a vulnerable thing. And I think we would like to state that. But I would invite the listener to notice the emotions inside of them, especially notice that discomfort. That's like step one. Notice discomfort and then name it like, oh, and and in a non-judgmental way, like in a, a way that doesn't frame one party as the problem or the victim. And so just saying, oh, I feel a little uncomfortable right now. I um, notice that maybe we're getting a little activated. You know, phrases like that, that are we focused are really helpful because the relationship is at the center then instead of my needs or your needs. I'm bringing it toward this we, which is actually what's happening is the emotions between us. And so I think that that's one way that can be really helpful. And then I also think being able to take a break when we need to. There is no shame in that, you know, to say I even I mean, use an excuse if you want, like, oh, excuse me for just a second. I need to use the restroom. There is no shame, people. Some people we can't be vulnerable with. And sometimes we need a moment to process what's going on inside of us. Feel free to take a break. Also, where you can be honest and just say, I I wonder if a break would serve us well. Could we come back to this in 15 minutes? The pause is what we call it therapeutically. Taking a pause between our thoughts and actions, taking a pause between the emotion and our determination of it, and taking a pause between our communication. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the be still, if you will, exercise and inviting us to just allow God into it to have a little piece of restoration before we move forward so we can navigate better. Mm -hmm. How much of this, I shouldn't say how much of this, but this, this just sounds like a lot of emotional intelligence. Mm. Is there, is there a level of emotional intelligence that maybe we collectively as a culture need to work on so we can kind of <laughs> move through this a little bit better? Right, like, I, so, feel I feel like that's such <laughs> a, a good Lutheran answer only because we're super about learning things. I think that it's, it's not one of our core doctrines, but it tends to be part of Lutheran culture, if you will. And yeah. so, yes, by all means, I wrote a book and it's an actual book because I want you to learn things. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I'm hoping it can lead to some intelligence. However, I do think intelligence is like only part of the equation, right? Mm. Because intelligence is like related to information or my, like there's a limitation to it, like a cap on it. Like we all have so much intelligence. We can maybe expand it, but for the most part, the capacity is limited. I think where this is bigger than that. I think also nuances of relational connectedness is important and interpersonal skills matters here, as well as things that we can't control. Like that's why it's called emotions in the gospel, because God is emotional. He's in our emotions. He knows more than we do. And sometimes we need that connection with him. I think often we need that connection with him more than we need any skills in this situation so that we can navigate it more fully in our sense of self, that we can access who we are as people, but also God and his sacrifice for us and his forgiveness. And then, I mean, we navigate so much more fully when we live in the freedom of Christ and we live in the forgiveness of Christ in our lives. And so I think it is fuller than emotional intelligence. There's a lot of components to it. But certainly, please do learn about yourself and your emotions and emotions in general. Hmm. So this chapter, you also speak about 
the, the differences between women and men. And you also use the term validation in this. And we only have about like four and a half, five minutes left. <laughs> I think we need a whole episode on the differences between men and women when it comes to experiencing emotions. Yes. Is there a whole chapter? I haven't gotten that far no, in the book. Is no, there a whole chapter? We, can that? we put on the end a bonus episode? Let's do that. Because I do have a lot to say about that, but it will be a rabbit hole right now. So okay. I, right, want, so, I want to do it. Let's so do it. Let's, let's talk about validation then okay. and this term that comes up. And what is its place in relationships in the body of Christ? So the body of Christ being a place where we ideally can be vulnerable, right? Like I think God created the church on earth as that extended family where we have a place to go when A, our people have disappointed us, but also just we have a fuller understanding of our support system and who's available to us and and who is transmitting the gospel to us. And that's their actual purpose. You know, that's a really safe place when those things are held. So validation, I think, belongs wholeheartedly in the body of Christ. However, I want to define validation for you because it's an essential need of humanity, which means it'll be an essential need within the body of Christ. But I do think we have misconceptions about validation that get in the way. So validation is not necessarily agreement. It is not necessarily having the same perspective or it, it isn't related to um, like putting a rubber stamp on truth or justice or anything like that. And I think that's where we get a little tripped up. So we think validation is the yes, ma'am, and the yes, sir in life. And that isn't it. Validation is noting how someone feels or thinks and being aware of it and acknowledging it. And that is all. If you move toward agreement, great. If you don't, fine. However, the acknowledgement of someone's thoughts and feelings are a basic way that they are heard and seen in this world. And I think it's actually a basic foundation for someone hearing and receiving the gospel too. That's why God gives us the word. He validates us all over the place by saying, I see your human experience. I see where you are in your sin and in your hurt and in your pain, and I want to come to you and we will do this together. That's validation. And so if you come to me and you, one of you have said, oh, I just had this meeting and it was really frustrating. And, you know, it's not my job to tell you where you're right or wrong. It's a basic human need for, for me to hear what you heard and not just offer feedback. Like I can repeat what you said. Yeah, that's great. Listening skills. But also to offer validation, which says, so that meeting was hurtful to you. Like, tell me more. Help me understand that hurt. What what happened particularly that you felt was a trigger for you? Those just me acknowledging that emotion in it is the validated in peace, not just me repeating the phrases that you just said. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. It sounds like such a like a simple way to change our language. And yet it that makes such a big difference in in just connecting with other people. It kind of sounds like a bid for connection oh, drawing on yeah, some of Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. A little Gottman research for you there too. And that's in some of our past yeah. episodes. Yeah. And a big part of finding hope. I think being able to note the emotion means that I have to have done some emotional work. Right. So back to the beginning of this episode of whether I'm willing to read the emotions in the room and whether I can hold them not so close to my chest that they feel overwhelming for me. And and we just used an example that I think is a, an emotion of discomfort often for people like hurt or frustration, anger, and those things. But we could also do this with joy, right? You're, you're, you come home and, and you, maybe you just had a good run or you got a promotion or you just, I don't know, got concert tickets. I don't know. The person like experiencing that with you, validation says we are I am here with you. We're we're having this moment together. And so it's relationally connecting, but also again has that person feeling seen and heard so that they they don't have a pin stuck in their joy. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it's it, it is joy as a flash, if you will, of an emotion. And I know there's Jesus joy, and that's a different thing. But we want to be able to have people 
experience their emotion and move through them, right? We use that idea of a leaf on a river going down or a wave that comes and goes. That's emotion. But we want people to fully have them and process them. And that leads to our health. And we know that. So we want to hold that together. And there is a lot on the relationship of emotion to logic and reason in our lives and relationships in this chapter. But now you just have to go read the chapter to learn more about it yeah. because we're, we're all, out all out of time. Such it's a so, good chapter. So helpful. <laughs> oh, okay. Final thought, 30 seconds. Do you have a final thought that you want to throw at us, Heidi, before we wrap up? I think going back to that, consider just having a relationship with your own emotions before you jump into how you're going to navigate and fix <laughs> the relational life that you have with emotions with others. I'm all about validation. You'll hear me say it again and again and again. But first, the first step really is to be aware of what's going on inside ourselves and and wrestle that out with God. You know, have a little discernment with God and help him or <laughs> let him help you sort through that. And then I think we'll be able to do the other work a little bit more related to logic and reason, if you will, while appreciating our emotional lives. Emotions and the Gospel. Our guest, Deaconess Heidi Gaiman, always great to chat with you. Thanks so much for being with us again this morning. Thanks for having me. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.